Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020. Uh, once again, we are coming to you remotely. Uh, first order of business tonight is approval of minutes. Uh, we do have two sets of minutes. The first is the business meeting uh, from May 27th. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Thank you, Mara. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, unanimous. Uh, we also have minutes from executive session on May 27th. Um, during that executive session, it was just the four of us. Uh, Ms. Smith was not in um, that executive session. Motion to approve those minutes. So moved. So moved. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Maya. Seconded by Dave. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Four. Uh, abstention? Abstain. Okay. Four zero to one. Thank you so much. Um, moving right along, uh, Dr. Thompson, do we have any correspondence this evening? Do not, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Catania, I believe you told me earlier we do not have any warrants that you signed, correct? Correct, there were no warrants. Okay. Uh, so next on our agenda is public forum. Um, I am checking the email address that we have set up for public forum. At this time, I do not see any emails, but just as a reminder to the public, you can email us at any time at NPS School Committee norward.k12.ma.us. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, June 17th, and anything we receive in between now and then, I will read at public forum on the 17th. So at this time, any announcements, Dr. Thompson? Uh, no, I'll save those for my superintendent's report, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Uh, so we do have a number of appearances this evening. Uh, we have Mr. Quigley, who is going to be sharing with us a school health council update and also the update at wellness policy. Uh, we have the principals tonight from the Old Ham, Callahan, um, and Willett and LMPA joining us. Um, and then we do have another appearance that on our agendas is listed under new business. But if the school committee is okay with it, I would like to pull that up under appearances um, so that our guests tonight from the May Center Institute don't have to stay with us um, for the majority of the meeting. Um, so I would like to have them go um, after the improvement plan from the Willet. Is that okay with the committee? Yes. It's fine with me. All right, great. Uh, so first guest is uh, Mr. Quigley. All right, good evening. Can everybody? Uh, hear me and hear and see me okay we can thank you for joining us all right thank you very much for having me and uh, you know truthfully on behalf of the entire uh school health council um thank you for uh giving me and, and giving the group the opportunity this evening to uh talk with you about our work this year um you know before we went into an extended school closure but also um you know our work since the school closure occurred as well as what our plans are for, you know, for the future, uh, starting in the fall. Well, you know, the entire district has a, a lot of work ahead of itself. We know that given the unique circumstances. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking forward to continuing and in really initiating some of the ideas and the work that the council had discussed and worked on over the course of this year. Uh, but, but most importantly, obviously, you know, uh, discussing the, the draft proposal of the updated wellness policy with, with the committee. Um, I'd like to, if I may, uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen with you just to give you a little bit of a, a background of sort of how we got here and some of the work we've done this year. So I'm gonna try to do that right now. I've done it successfully before. <laughs> so we'll see if this works. Everybody's getting a lot of practice with, with uh, virtual Google Hangouts. All right, can everybody see the screen? Can everybody see my screen right now? Not yet. There it is, it's coming. Okay. It should say Norwood Public Schools, School Health Council, 2019-2020. Be good. Yes. Okay, so just again, just a little bit of background on the work the group has done to date, uh, as well as you know some of our, our anticipated you know, work in the future. When we first got together in September, our purpose and our mission was to reestablish or, if you will, resurrect the School Health, uh, health Council, its membership. 
um, you know, get the group back together, start discussing some ideas, look at the current policy and, and really sort of dive into that current existing policy. Uh, the things that were accurate, um, areas for improvement, and as a group, how we could move forward in promoting uh, overall wellness for not just our students of the Norwood Public Schools, but also for the families and, and the community at large. We also wanted to review the current wellness policy and pr propose the updated version for you folks this evening for the policy manual. And we also wanted to facilitate some wellness activities and or events for the schools and the community. Needless to say, with the, the unexpected sudden school closure, the, the wellness activities, the community events did not uh, take place. But I think moving forward, that's absolutely going to be one of the top priorities for the for the council. I definitely need to acknowledge all of the members uh, who put some great time and effort into our work this year. Uh, I'm the current wellness department chair for grades six through 12. Chair Stewart was also on the committee. Paul Nimblett is a Coakley Middle School wellness teacher. Donna, I don't wanna mispronounce her name, so I'm gonna say Donna T, Donna uh, Toig, uh, representing the nurses uh, in the district. Eli Norris and Kelsey Massis, both representing the uh, Norwood Public Schools Food Services. And then Aubrey Seal, we all know very well as, uh, you know, she does tremendous work uh, with Impact Norwood and facilitating those opportunities for our kids in the community. So um, those are the current members of the group. Um, you know, moving forward, we absolutely would like to expand our, our membership to make sure we're um, taking in all of the ideas and thoughts from all the, the, the community stakeholders. We had four meetings this year in September and November of 2019, and then February and April. Uh, our April meeting was remote um, due to the pandemic. And just quickly, some of the accomplishments we have a draft wellness policy proposal for you this evening uh, to review and hopefully vote on. Um, and in terms of future plans, we look to make just recommendations. Again, I think it's important to point out our council, the work of this council is by no means uh, a policy making group. It's, it's really just um, trying to make some solid recommendations to the, Nor uh, the Norwood administrative team, teachers, and you as school committee members regarding continued opportunities to improve the overall wellness of our students. And again, getting back to some of those possibilities and opportunities to host and facilitate community wellness events in the future. So that's, that's sort of just a really quick recap of our work this year and, and our intentions for the future. Um, a lot of variables still at play. I'm going to. Are we, we good? Are we, are we still? still? Looks so good. Okay. My apologies. My apologies. Um, Brian, I don't think we can hear you anymore. And I see two of you now for some reason. I don't know if everybody else sees two, Ryan. How does it, how does it sound now? It sounds better. Is it better. Sorry about that. Uh, so really without you know any further ado, um, you know, I, I'm absolutely um, you know here to entertain and discuss the the draft that was put forward to to the committee. Um, I know there were some some questions and just some clarifications. Um, that members of the school committee uh, wanted to address. So feel free to, to start that discussion. And hopefully I can answer uh, some questions you may have and clarify some things. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Uh, so everybody on the committee, you should see in the packet, um, you know, the current draft, um, which I know uh, Ryan made some additional minor edits yesterday based off of some of the questions and feedback that, that the committee shared, um, you know, with Dr. Thompson. Um, but there is also the current wellness policy draft in your um, Google folders as well, if you wanted to see, you know, the policy before the school council started to um, edit it and work on it. 
are there specific questions or you know parts of the policy that you wanted to dis discuss further tonight with Ryan? Yeah, Maya. So uh, it looks like some of my um, questions have already been addressed a little bit. The the part about celebrations and rewards, it's clarified now that it's during the school day. Sure. So I I think I have no problem with it as written now. Um, okay. And then um, my only question is, um, and I and I don't have an. I want to be clear. I don't have an answer that I'm looking for here. I just want to understand sure. what what the the goal of this policy is in terms of food and beverage marketing in schools mm -hmm. um i understand how that applies to like specific foods but you know a lot of our like the parents music association does a fundraiser where it's like you know go to bertucci's tonight and present this flyer and you can you know they'll contribute a portion to our fundraiser um so I'm just wondering, how does it how does it work if we're like if it's not advertising for a specific food, but it's advertising for a restaurant that probably has some things that meet the USDA requirements and a, num a number of things that don't. Just curious what sure. what the, you think this policy would mean. Yeah, and it's a great a great question, and, and thank you for for asking for that clarification because I think number one. You know all of those types of events and activities. Um, you know I'm just finishing up really my first full year in Norwood. I've been here for a year and a half of my first full year, um, and I will tell you those events that you mentioned and some of the other ones um, that we know exist. They they're really part of the fabric, right? Of um, a, a student's experience. It really doesn't matter whether it's at the elementary, middle school, or high school level. Those evening uh, extracurricular events are really important. Um, so by no means, you know, in my opinion, and, I, and I'm going to speak for the council, uh, the other members of the council, do we want to interfere or limit those opportunities? Really, you know, in essence, start to micromanage those opportunities, okay. not by any stretch of the imagination. Interestingly enough, um, Kelsey Massis was able to um, sort of clarify uh, that question in, in particular in for the US DA 30 minutes before and then 30 minutes after the school day. So those afternoon evening events, um, believe it or not, um, you know, Massachusetts doesn't have any specific regulations regarding those events. Okay. They, they, the state department of public health as always is giving recommendations and sort of guidance but by no means are there any regulations that we have to abide by when it comes to those events. So I guess the, <laughs> that was sort of a long, a long winded answer in terms of, I don't envision those things being affected at all with this okay. policy. All right, great. Thank you very much. Are there other questions or feedback from other committee members at this time? If you compare the old policy to the, the draft before us tonight, you'll see that there was some additional topics added into the wellness policy. So we just want the community to understand, you know, some of the work that we did as a school health council um, was to really get in there, um, you know, that mental health piece, the SEL piece and the staff wellness piece. So the last two sections of the current policy that is being proposed tonight are brand new. Those weren't in the previous draft at all. Um, but how would the committee like to proceed? Are there any edits that you would like Mr. Quigley to work on or are we ready to vote on the updated policy tonight? Yeah, Joan. I, I thought it was clear. Uh, I think the improvements are needed and good. And so I would like to motion to approve the policy as written. Okay, thank you. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Mara, was there something that you wanted to say or were you just seconding it? I was just seconding. Okay. So any further discussion at this time? All right. All in favor of the updated wellness policies presented tonight? Aye. 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 Unanimous? All right. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Great. Um, thank you.
thank you, Mr. Quigley, for your time and for all that you are doing. And I know there's some other initiatives that you were working on that we will see you back again at some point, but uh, <laughs> hopefully Absolutely. we will be back in person by then and, and not doing this remote, but thank you. All right, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Great to see everybody. Continue to, to be well, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Keep up the good work. All right, thank you. Nice work, thank you. Take care. Bye. All right, so moving right along to our next appearance, the Oldham School Improvement Plan for one year. Um, and we do have two guests tonight, Mr. Griffin, who is the interim principal at the Oldham, um, and then also Mr. Olson, uh, who has recently been hired to be the principal at the Oldham for the next school year. Um, Dr. Thompson, was there anything that you wanted to share with us before we hand it over to Mr. Griffin and Mr. Olson? Well, I can probably share it. I'll try to keep it straight. Uh, yeah, I want to. I want to. Two things. First of all, um, I want to thank Bob for his work this year. Uh, he came in. Uh, he he, you know, took over the reins of a school. We 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 pulled him out of retirement. We, we didn't have to tug too hard. But we pulled him out of retirement. Uh, he came in with a, with, with a skip and a jump, um, and, and really helped uh, helped us out and. Again, brought his his expertise. I, I know that our new administrators really enjoy the opportunity to work with. What I scared him away. <laughs> oh, there he is. I scared you away, Bob. Um, but I'm I'm truly um, grateful for all of your work, Bob, uh, and your leadership. And it has been absolutely a pleasure to have the opportunity to work with you. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And then I also want to welcome uh, Mr. Olson. Um, we had. Uh, we had a good search, but we uh, we struck gold, in my opinion. I'm really looking forward to uh, to what Steve is going to bring to our team and bring to the old ham, uh, and, and we welcome him as well. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, get out of the way and let the uh, school improvement plan get pre uh, presented. Thank you for the kind words. Um, and as I've said many times, I haven't regretted this move once since I once I came back last August. I've the staff and the and the kids and the parents and 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 the administration uh, have all treated me wonderfully and I and I thank you all. Uh, I'm so glad I did it. It re-energized me. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Wyeth. I am here to review the school improvement plan of the Old Ham School as written by me last summer. I will begin by reviewing the three goals that were identified on the 1920 plan. The first area that I identified as an area that needed improvement involved the MCAS grade five science results from 2019. While analyzing those results, I became concerned that the fact that only 44% of that class either met or exceeded the state standards. And I also looked back uh, and, and saw some volatile fluctuations in their scores over the past four years. So I called on our elementary science coordinator, um, Erica Lockwood, and I strategized with her how to best promote more time and energy into our science program at all five grade levels. Um, our first objective was to utilize a very interesting online daily news, uh, newsletter that is called Newsella, N-E-W-S-E-L-A. Um, this, it's a uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders enjoy reading a, a current events article, but there's also two really interesting and two very uh, two very interesting social studies and two very interesting science articles every single day. Uh, and we decided to capitalize on the student interest by asking the third, fourth, and fifth graders to find time to at least cover one of the science articles and grade fives would try to find time to cover both science articles every day or as, or as often as possible. We also prioritized the science journal writing that the, that the, uh, children's do after after our science lessons. When our first and second graders uh, were involved, we suggested that they might they might use an art project or a class discussion if they hadn't got to the point of, of writing their journals yet. Now it needs to be explained that although the science articles are always interesting, they don't necessarily align with the concepts um, that our our curriculum outlined for a particular grade level. Our plan, however, involved piquing the children's interest in all aspects of science. In other words, a student who enjoys a particular subject will carry this interest into all facets of that subject. If a fourth grade article is about a rocket launch, but that's not a, that's not a, the topic of that particular grade level, the, I, we say, so what? Encourage the enjoyment of the rocket launch because eventually it all comes full cycle and the students will carry over the same interest. 
for plants, astronomy, electricity, machines, or even rocks. Then the journal writing and the drawings would supplement those lessons. With the cancellation of the MCAS testing this spring, we were unable to retrieve the hard data that we wanted, but we were especially disappointed because our current fifth graders scored 80% meeting or exceeding the standards last year, and uh, math and science scores often go hand in hand. We know, however, that we did everything necessary to whet their appetites for all things science at the school. Number two on the progress section of the plan identified the implementation of the Renaissance online assessment program for grades three, four, and five in math and ELA. Um, our district provided plenty of PD, identified two trainers from each elementary school, and contracted for seven face-to-face -face online meetings with re Renaissance personnel whenever necessary. Um, it's, it's, it's a program that's working quite smoothly for us now. And number three on the progress portion was a uh, uh, search for a new elementary reading program. ELA coordinator Stephanie West chose three popular programs and distributed them to all schools, different schools at different grade levels. Mrs. West organized four major meetings throughout the year to hear strengths and weaknesses of all three programs. My view from the, the Pearson Company was chosen as the reading series that best met the, the needs of our district. Um, priority areas for 2021, 2022. Number one, obvious, I, in my opinion, would be to continue with the science priority. Um, we, we really haven't had a chance to look at the hard data from what from what we implemented last year, and I, I'm confident that it's that it's going to improve, but. Um, I, I think because we didn't have a chance to actually look at that uh, and analyze the results of that yet, that that would be uh, a continued priority next year. Number two, we'll be rolling out the MyView reading program. Um, all materials have arrived in the schools. I have them all divided by grade level and laid out on the cafeteria tables. Stephanie West will conduct her first professional development on uh, this Friday, June 5th. 10.30 for grades K to 2 and 12.30 for grades 3, 4, and 5. I felt that the new old team principal, Steve Olson, who I believe is here with us this evening, and now I know he is, should be able to implement his goals for the coming year. So I generously left him priorities 3 and 4. Um, and I, I welcome you, Steve, and, and I assure you that you are going to love being the principal of the old Ham school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Feels like a baton passing moment. I appreciate it, Mr. Griffin. I heard great things about the work that you did. So thank you. Bob, Bob please. And, uh, and we'll be in touch tomorrow. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Griffin. Um, any questions or comments um, from the school committee members on the school improvement plan for the next year um, for the first two priorities for the old hand? Yeah, Dave. Hi, Teresa. Um, Mr. Griffin, uh, really, thank you so much. Uh, you were fantastic to have as a principal, and uh, we really appreciate everything you've done for uh, the community and the students while you were in, you know, it feels like we just had you come on, so, like, last week, and uh, time flies, but we're really grateful for everything you've done, so thank you again. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. As I said earlier, I meant to, I meant to, I, I, I loved the, the kids, the staff, uh, everybody was wonderful to me over there. Great. Any further comments on the school improvement plan or is there a motion to approve it? Mara? Yep, motion to approve. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dave. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, unanimous, wonderful. Um, Mr. Olson, not to put you on the spot, you can you can say I'm good, but is there anything that you would like to share with us tonight since this is our first opportunity to see you and get to know you a little bit more? Um, yes, thanks for the opportunity. I'm just really excited to join the community. I've been um, hearing a lot of great things and I'm talking to folks who live there and who've been through the school system um, in my own social circles and doing all the research that I needed to do. It, it became a more and more um, appealing position. So I was really excited to be offered it. And I think that I do have some of the skills that are needed to, to move the um, work that Mr. Griffin, Bob, uh, started with the staff and the staff has been doing. So um, I'm excited to get in there and um, at least remotely <laughs> on video, hopefully mm -hmm. physically soon, and uh, start to see what's going on and see where we can really uh, 
move things forward and, and really um, help to make the things that are going great stay great. So I appreciate the opportunity and I, I know we'll be speaking a lot more. Well, thank you and, and welcome. Um, did the committee have any questions for Mr. Olson at this time? No, all right. Well, Mr. Olson and Mr. Griffin, thank you so much for your time this evening um, and stay well. Thank, thank you, you very much. Stay well. Thank you. So moving right along to our next improvement plan um, is Mrs. Brown uh, presenting the one year school improvement plan for the Callahan. How are you, Mrs. Brown? Good, how are you? Good. So good evening, members of the school committee, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Wyeth, and Mrs. Sheridan. It is with great pleasure that I share information pertaining to our current school improvement plan, as well as the goals for our one year plan. I only did two goals this year, so I'm gonna have Bob do great goals three and four, just kidding. Um, <laughs> we made great strides in meeting the action steps of our previous plan, despite our abrupt departure to remote learning. I'm proud of the work we have done to meet the needs of all learners through differentiated instruction, station rotations, and small group targeted instruction. We have seen tremendous growth in decoding skills from students in grades one and two with the addition of our foundations program. Our progress is also noted in our school accountability data provided by DESI, where we went from 41% to 96% in terms of the criterion reference targets set by DESI for our school. And that table is in our current school improvement plan for next year. Strengthening our professional learning community occurred in a number of different initiatives. Our new block schedule allowed for weekly common planning time, which the other principals alluded to, and this was done with a cross-section of participants. Staff engaged in discussions pertaining to an array of topics, promoting a positive collaborative culture that had a direct impact on student growth and learning. Unfortunately, a number of our learning celebrations did not occur when we went to a remote learning situation. Safety of our students and staff has always been a focus at the Callahan, and we are continually reviewing and updating our procedures in this area. Um, as you know, social emotional initiatives have continued at the Callahan, and with a response to intervention mo model in grades one and two that was extremely effective. We implemented a number of SEL programs, such as the Zones of Regulation, Collaborative Problem Solving, and PBIS, Positive Behavioral Incentives Systems. Staff meetings were centered around our fourth goal, which was standard-based information and skills, and this transferred into our classroom. Our proposed plan for the next school year align, um, involves four priority areas that are aligned to the district's strategic plan. These areas include, number one, instructional practices, number two, implementing the newly adopted ELA curriculum, Number three, continuing with social emotional learning. And number four is culturally responsive practices. For our first priority area, we will continue the work we started this year to expand and improve upon our instructional practices. We are committed to providing differentiation, small group instruction, peer collaboration, and project-based learning experiences. Intervention is a key component to meeting the needs of all students, and we will continue with collaboration between staff, as well as data collection that will be reviewed and used to drive our instruction. We hope to expand our flexible seating options, but know that this may be on hold based upon our current situation. Our STEM initiative as part of the library experience is a highlight for many of our students. Mr. Rulin has created a true project-based learning environment, and we will continue this in both an in-person and an online platform. This year, he even um, started a coding club on Monday for students, so he is up and running whether we're in-person or online. Our next goal pertains to the newly adopted ELA curriculum, which is what many of the other schools have also done. And as Bob mentioned, Stephanie is already having PD this week, and we anticipate that the majority of our initial common planning meetings will revolve around this topic. Once again, social emotional learning will be a focus for our learning community. Our sensory path was a huge hit, and we hope to recreate this when we return to school. 
we will be using a new PBIMS model, which was actually um, shared with us by a behavioral consultant that Lori Semino had for our task program. And we loved it so much that we wanted to extend it school wide. It's known as high five, where five stands for flexible, in the zone, valuing others and becoming an excellent citizen. This can be rolled out in either in person or remotely. We hope to expand our student leadership opportunities and our community service projects. Finally, we will be introducing trauma-informed teaching practices to our staff so that we are prepared to recognize and respond to those who have been impacted by traumatic stress. This will be a major focus given our current situation. Our school adjustment counselors have been working um, and participating in a number of workshops over the past two months and have actually created a Callahan crisis team drive where they are putting different documents that our staff and our crisis team have been reviewing. Um, and our last area, um, that we would like to work on is culturally responsive practices. We are extremely proud of our diverse community and want to make sure that all of our families are informed and welcomed at our school. Most recently, and I know it's not on my school improvement plan, but my school adjustments counselor sent me the DESI MTSS Academy applications, which is multi-tiered system of support. And we did apply for Culturally Responsive Teaching Academy. Um, we don't know if we will be um, um, chosen. And then Margo also found it, and she found that there's a teaching academy, a leadership, um, culturally responsive leadership academy. So I think as a district, that is one goal that we are hoping to really promote. And that is um, my update, and I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Mrs. Brown. Uh, feedback, questions from the committee for the Callahan Improvement Plan? No, Mara? Oh, I thought you raised your hand, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna call you out all night long, Mara, since it's my last chance to do so, okay? <laughs> somebody, somebody should, it's my last time, I'm gonna keep you on my toes. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Brown, didn't mean to cut you off, are you sharing something? No, I just said my, I think she was just waiting for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so is there a motion to approve the Callahan one-year school improvement plan? Motion to approve. Thank you, Mara. Is there a second? I second. Second by Joan. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right. So up next is Ms. Robin sharing with us the one-year school improvement plan for both the Willett and the LMPA. Uh, welcome, Ms. Robbins. How are you tonight? Fine, how are you? Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen as I have a couple slides that'll just help us walk through my presentation for the evening. Um, I know sometimes it can be helpful to have a visual when you've been listening for a long time. So here we go. Oops. Okay, so this is... Um, the Early Childhood School Improvement Plan that covers the Little Mustangs Preschool Academy and the Willet. We are a one-year plan. Um, so I just wanted to start with some demographic points of interest. Um, and I also want to address some of the um, questions that were sort of previously submitted from the school committee um, throughout my presentation. So this is one area where I'll be able to do that. Um, so for the Willett Kindergarten, just an enrollment update for fall of 2020, although that's not really technically in our improvement plan. I know um, uh, Mrs. Stewart was interested in, in hearing about this. We have 253 students registered as of today for kindergarten. Historical data tells us we can anticipate 20 to 40 more registrations over the summer, meaning a cohort size of 270 to 290. Um, so we seem like we're <clears throat> sort of heading to that mean cohort size, which is 282. So a typically sized kindergarten hopefully coming to us in the fall. Um, one uh, demographic I like to pull out um, is just that continually growing EL population. Kindergarten is our first opportunity to be able to see what an entire cohort of students uh, looks like in terms of percentages of, per uh, of limited English proficiency. So you can see um, that we are, um, while we had a little dip last year, we are on an upward trajectory um, in terms of our EL students. Um, th what's, uh, so that's 28% of our students are receiving uh, services for uh, ESL. Uh, another interesting point though is that um, even though this represents who our LEPs are, um, it does, 
uh, it doesn't speak to the fact that um, 46% of our population reports that there is a language other than English spoken in the home. So almost half of our families have a, have a second language spoken in their home. So I think that's just an important demographic to continue to monitor as we, as we go through uh, the years here. Um, for the LMPA preschool, uh, I just wanted to point out a few things here. So um, our total enrollment, so this was another question that came up um, going into the fall, uh, we anticipate 135 students um, with 74 peers and 61 students on, uh, 61 plus students on IEPs. The plus is there because um, we're in a limbo a little bit right now with some of our early intervention referrals. Uh, due to the fact that we haven't been able to um, have all the do, do all the evaluations and have the meetings necessary to be able to get them um, qualified or or not qualified for our program. we've had um, in our program already and we anticipate another 11 to 12 uh, between now and September um, I'd like to just note that um, you can see that the that the enrollment is going up at the preschool. Um, that 135 number is actually quite concerning, both to myself and Ms. Kai, in the sense that um, we ended our school year, or we, or I shouldn't say we've ended our school year, we're not quite there yet, but we, we right now have 140 students in our preschool. Um, and the only way we've been able to um, accommodate that growth is, you'll notice that we start in October, or usually around 105, 110. Last year, we saw an increase to 122. This year, we're going to see an increase to 135. And what that means is we are looking at a fall semester in which we do not have room for our three-year-olds who are going to be um, uh, aging into our program. So that is a, a concern that we have, um, but we are going to do the best we can with that as we move forward. Another interesting point is that um, PACS enrollment has gone up. I apologize, that little bar is coming up here. Um, uh, so our PAC is our severe uh, students with um, significant uh, significant disabilities, typically autism spectrum disorder. Um, we went from one section that by the end of 2018-19 uh, was full at 10 to two sections that were almost full um, at uh, for this year. And then going into starting next year, again, we're looking at starting those two sections full and full for sub separate in preschool is nine students per section. So we can have 18 students uh, in, in PACS total. Um, so I just wanna kind of point that out that our autism population is growing in leaps and bounds um, and the level of need for our special needs students in LMPA continues to increase significantly. So that means we have to provide more services and uh, more programming for those students who are coming to us. Okay, so some updates from our uh, school improvement plan from last year. Um, so we had a similar goal with the ELA pilot, but also strengthening our foundation. So we had an ELA goal. So LMPA and Willett continue to refine their phonics practices. We had a second full year of foundations implementation um, and it is continuing to serve our students quite well. At the preschool, all of our four-year-olds get um, a pretty thorough introduction to uh, foundations and three-year-olds have uh, exposure to it as well. Uh, at the kindergarten level, we are full force with our uh, kindergarten foundations um, and our data is looking really great. Um, unfortunately, we can't do our end of the year data catch like we normally would, but our mid-year data looked quite good with most of our students knowing their letters and sounds and that is a real um, uh, tribute to foundations, but also the faithful and skillful implementation by the staff at the Willet. Um, six Willet teachers participated in the ELA pilot. There were three programs, as you've heard before. We've chosen my view. Um, I will say that my view of the three programs probably was not the preferred for kindergarten and first grade. However, we are confident, I am confident that we are gonna be able to do the work necessary to um, make some adjustments to the program to make it feel a little bit more appropriate for kindergarten. Uh, Stephanie West has put a proposal in to have some summer work uh, around doing that work with some of the teachers at the Willet. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, it's a solid program. I don't have any concerns about it. Um, we just have to do a little bit of tweaking to make it appropriate for kindergarten students. Um, and then um, to echo what my colleagues have said, we're gonna have a, a, a pre, uh, our first PD on that on June 5th. 
We had an SEO goal, which was to strengthen our open circle practices. So all of our teachers got a refresher training in January of 2020, and the few who hadn't gotten the full kit and caboodle got going with that as well, the three-day training. Um, and we are implementing open circle weekly in our classrooms. LMPA, do, uh, there is no preschool version of open circle. So LMPA has done a staff created SEL monthly theme um, calendar. The theme is introduced in an all school meeting by the SLP and carried through in the classroom for various projects and activities. And a monthly newsletter goes home to LMPA families. Um, and I'd really like to give a shout out to Michelle McCarthy, uh, the SLP at the LMPA for really um, uh, jazzing up those <laughs> school all school meetings. And also uh, to Emily Kai, the head teacher there who supports that work and also writes that newsletter each month. And then um, this past year, I was able to introduce the concept of becoming trauma informed to most of the staff. Um, I was able to do a two hour workshop with all LMPA staff, so professional and paraprofessional, and then the paraprofessional staff at the Willet. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to doing it with the kindergarten teachers, teaching staff, the professional staff, because we just ran out of half day PDs and they had other PD obligations that they had on some of those other days. Uh, we had a goal for Aging Dive Families, we did a new event this year that was new for us, which was to host a parent only evening to learn more about the backgrounds and experiences of the families in our school district. Um, we had about 10 parents who participate participated, which I, th I in addition to our school council who was there. Um, and I thought that was a pretty good turnout. Um, and it was very interesting to hear some of their perspectives uh, about school um, in Norwood. And then we had planned to do our second annual family cultural night. We did our first one last year and it was amazing. But unfortunately, that was one of those things that's gone by the wayside with school closure. Hopefully we can do it again next year. And then our final priority was technology inventory. Uh, we inventoried our existing technology and identified two areas for expansion. LMPA would like smart boards, smart boards and projectors for their classrooms. Um, they do not have them, all the Willet does and all the elementary schools do, but um, LMPA does not. Um, and then the Willet would like to increase the number of iPads so each classroom can have six to eight devices for use in tech-based learning centers for independent practice and reinforcement of ELA and math skills. So those have been um, included in the capital outlay request. Um, so those are all just pen pending funding. So our priorities for uh, this one year plan um, are we are going to, um, the first one is the ELA. So just like all of my colleagues have stated before me, we are going to be part of the training and implementation of my view. Um, so that training starts Friday and then we have a full day training on September 1st and we're looking forward to digging into that new curriculum. Uh, priority area number two, uh, we are going to continue to strengthen our practices in social emotional learning with a focus on mentor texts. So um, I've already been able to purchase um, uh, some pretty extensive classroom libraries for the Willet that will support that came from the uh, recommended book list from Open Circle. Um, so we have already um, have those on order and hopefully going to be delivered soon. <laughs> um, so we are going to be able to expand how we talk about SEL by really linking it back to high quality mentor text. Um, and I hope to do something similar for LMPA. We need to identify some texts that match those SEL monthly topics and hopefully be able to get those for those classrooms as well. And then finally, I chose to have a priority area um, focus um, specifically on flexible models of uh, instruction for COVID-19. Um, so uh, remote learning has its challenges for everybody. It is particularly challenging at the early childhood level uh, when you consider that um, all learning at that age and stage requires a lot of adult support um, and a lot of adult facilitation. Um, so I want to make sure that we are continuously thinking about uh, what we are going to do uh, in order to support families with remote learning, but also uh, if we have to be in a remote learning situation, uh, but also how we can flex in and out of uh, models. My hope actually, uh, my sort of thought and philosophy around this for early childhood is to try to minimize the amount of remote that we have to do. Um, obviously, that is dependent upon conditions on the ground. But my hope is that if we are site based, even for part of the time, that that is the time that we're going to maximize with students. Um, and remote learning will be a, a, a much uh, smaller piece for our younger kids than it is for our older kids. Um, that's not to try to say I want to minimize the amount of, um, you know, the expectations for learning and, and understanding the curriculum 
curriculum and learning the frameworks. Um, I just think we have to be really cautious with um, how we approach that with three, four, and five-year-olds. Uh, one thing we've learned this spring is that a group with uh, five, three language delayed three-year-olds on a speech and language therapy session is about as goes about as well as you would imagine that to go. <laughs> it's really, it's really one. Wonderful and precious in so many ways, but certainly a very challenging way to try to um, to work with young children. Um, and then I just want to end by giving a huge shout out to the LMPA and Will and Willett staff. We are a group of Wonder Women, and not to leave out Mr. Hardery, Mr. Joe, or Mr. Doug, uh, who are supermen as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, we have done, I, I just can't say enough good things about the work that the staff has done um, in these very challenging times coming together to create really wonderful and enriching remote learning opportunities for our pre-K through five, uh, five-year-old. <laughs> Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the committee if they have any questions, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Mrs. Robbins. Uh, questions or feedback from the committee on the Willa and LMPA improvement plan? No? Is there a motion to approve the one-year improvement plan? So moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Thank you, Mara. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, unanimous 5-0. Thank you, Mrs. Robbins. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, Carol. All right. So moving along, um, as I said earlier, I'd like to pull up the new business uh, at this time. Um, we do have two guests with us this evening from the May Center Institute. Um, Dr. Thompson, would you like to share a little bit more with the community um, why uh, we have this presentation before us tonight? Yes, uh, so the May Institute is looking to uh, to relocate uh, to Norwood. Uh, as part of that process, they need to have their uh, curriculum reviewed and approved by the school committee. So we have uh, the director of the May Institute, Andrea Potsny Gray, and uh, the, the the vice president of educational programs, uh, Pamela Ray, with us to, this evening to present uh, to you uh, their program, so you can be informed about that. So I don't know who's uh, taking the lead on this, but I will yield the floor. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? This is my first Google Meets, so um, I'm a little little concerned. I've been boning up on it all morning to try to make sure I didn't uh, miss, miss anything. So um, thank you all so much for um, finding some time for us today. Um, to, uh, to share a little bit about our program and to, um, to seek your approval for, um, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, for our curriculum, for our program. We found a wonderful location in Norwood and we are um, looking to, um, to relocate our program. So we wanna share a little bit about that program with you today. Um, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen because I've been practicing. So I don't, <laughs> let's see how it goes. So. Um, we just want to share a, just a brief video. I promise it's brief. It's under three minutes, but it just gives a nice flavor of our program for you. So um, I'm going to say a little prayer and hope that this works. I'll let you know when we can see you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There you go. All right. Starting to come up. There we go. Talk to anybody. It was my Good. first choice and my only choice. William, how does it make you feel? All right, go for it. Welcome to the May Center. Happy to see you. I mean, they're great to us. I know that my daughter's being taken care of, and I know that she's safe, and that's the most important thing. They go above and beyond just um, you know, going through the motions of the job. People do actually care. Just, this is a great place because it gives them a sense of belonging. She feels loved and nurtured, and, and she does belong. She wants to, actually, she wants to move into residential because she wants to be there all the time. Our school here is for children and adolescents with brain injuries and neurological issues. What parents often tell me um, is that they really feel a sense of relief that we understand children and adolescents with brain injuries and the challenges that they experience. And they'll say to us, oh, I you know, finally found a school that understands my child's needs. I think the most important thing is they clearly recognize each student as an individual and they're willing to custom tailor what they need to to make that individual successful. Go 
one thing that is remarkable about this program is teamwork. Working together, we're going to be able to produce results that you you wouldn't be able to produce with people working individually. I think my favorite part is seeing the students' growth. You know, being here for four years, I've had students Which that was? I've been with since day one, and seeing the progress that they make both behaviorally and with their skill sets. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your day, buddy. I just love to watch them grow. I love to watch them be happy. Our goal is to transition the kids from either here back to public school or from here to adult services. We have plenty of kids who came here and couldn't talk and now are talking up a storm. Couldn't walk and are walking all over the place or uh, couldn't go out in the community because of their behavior and now they're working out in the community. We come to work every day with the same mentality. We're here for these kids, and that's our job. We're here to make sure that they're safe, that they're learning, and that they're able to transition from one place to another. I would definitely emphasize the fact that our staff is very caring, very dedicated, um, that we would be in touch with them as frequently as they would like us to be, and um, I would reassure them that their child is in the best hands. Okay, now you're back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, and my screen is gone, and I'm back. Okay, perfect. Okay, Great. yay! It worked. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh oh, now it's gonna play again. Is it playing again? <laughs> We're Zoom people, so bear with us. Yeah, right. sorry. There you go. Okay, there we go. I gotta stop the video. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Andrea to be able to talk a little bit. She's the executive director of the of the program and has been um, with the May for over 27 years. And so um, she knows a lot about the program and those kids and, and the great work that they do. So I want her to have a few minutes to talk and we're definitely gonna stay on time. Dave definitely encouraged <laughs> us to stay on time. Yeah. So we're gonna take care of that for you. So go ahead, Andrea. Yes, well, thank you so much again for having us. I know it's a busy time of year for all of you, so we'll keep it brief. Um, uh, we sent you some information in advance that I think describes our program a little bit, as well as um, gives a little brief summary of the assessments that we, we typically use, as well as our curricula. Um, the video, though, it's a couple years old. I don't know if you noticed, a, there's a few Norwood teachers in there. I don't know if, if you guys caught that, that um, I worked with in the past that I know we're working with you now. Um, even though it's a couple years old, it really does, I think, capture um, who we are, the profile of our students, which is very diverse, as well as um, our multidisciplinary approach that we have. Um, the, the students that we have, it, I think sometimes um, public schools are more familiar with some of our other schools that serve children with AST, and we are very different. It's a very unique, um, uh, diverse group of students. Some students are working on some very functional kinds of goals, whereas we have others that um, are working on um, grade level or near grade level material geared towards earning their high school diploma. And there's a lot of students kind of in the middle. So again, it is um, the curriculum is uh, really individualized um, as well as the assessment component. We typically use direct instruction supplemented with web-based assessments that are tied to the standards. So um, just to talk a little bit about more about our students, even though it is so diverse, there are some kind of common, um, some common uh, challenges that they have. Typically, it is a combination of um, physical, cognitive, and behavioral challenges. And the behavioral challenges really do, are quite a range as well. Um, some students, you know, they, it, it's pretty infrequent that they have um, some difficulties, whereas there's others where it's quite, you know, they have um, even aggressive behaviors. So the, um, the I guess the common theme that, another common theme is that they can be very impulsive, have difficulty with problem solving, um, judgment, and transitions tend to be a real struggle for a number of our students. So our setting has uh, eight classrooms right now, and it's a high uh, staff to student ratio. 
And we do have um, OTPT speech and nursing. And um, you saw some of the other services that are on the video. So that's kind of the students in a nutshell. And um, for some outcome measures, just for you to be aware of, we are an ABA program, so we collect a lot of data. And um, about 98% of our students' IEP um, goals either were achieved or progressing last year. So that's, we have some pretty you know, high success rate there. And we really do like to um, really work on uh, transitioning students back to less restrictive settings a lot. And um, we actually have a couple of students right now that we're working, well, we were pre-pandemic, I'm working towards getting them back to public school and hopefully we'll, we'll resume with that when um, the you know, schools reopen. But um, it, about 67% in the last couple of years did either return back to public school or um, uh, transition to a less restrictive environment. So that's kind of a little snapshot. Um, do you have any questions at all about anything we sent you or just our school in general? Thank you so much for being here. Um, are there questions, feedback from the committee at this time, Maya? Just a plan on uh, a question about when you're planning to move and where? Okay, I can share that. So we are um, looking at um, the building at One Commerce Way in, in Norwood. It's um, behind the shopping plaza. I think there might be a grocery store there near Home Depot, kind of right yeah. off of Route 1. Um, and, um, it's actually a property that used to be uh, the May Institute's property. And so then, uh, several years, I, I heard the history several years, we, um, sold it and now we want it back. Um, okay. we just really feel that's kind of how it goes. Right. Um, we just really feel like this is a really ideal setting for us. When we decided that we wanted to move from our current location, we started looking, you know, to get kind of a little more centralized and not, not so deep into a town. And so this is just really an ideal setting. Um, the property is, um, we're to close in the, in July on the property. And then we figure it'll probably be at least 12 months, um, till we're able to, um, move the school. So okay, going to do some, some, some construction and things. So. All right. Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions at this time? So to clarify, you're before us this evening because you need a vote of approval of the curriculum that you shared. Is that accurate? Yeah, that, that's technically what the the mm -hmm. um, the Department of Ed is is requesting. Yes. Okay. Okay. So is there a motion from the committee to approve the curriculum of the May Center Institute as was presented to us tonight? Hang on. I have a. Can I ask another yeah. question? Sure, John. This, this has less to do with the May Institute and more to do about procedurally. Does this mean that we because we're approving the curriculum, does this, like, are we going to be looking at school improvement plans or any of those other things? No, it's no, just no, no, an approval no. of a curriculum. It's no, just, this, yeah. No, this, just wanted it's a one and done. It. Yeah, it's <laughs> one and done. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a one and done. This is kind of a, um, you know, a leftover where school committees would would uh, would approve curriculum. So because it's a school in, uh, it's, it's an old law. <laughs> okay. So this is like basically if there was something that was a curriculum that was super objectionable, that's why the, right. the mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Always good to clarify. <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that, you know, if we want to add another school improvement plan on every year, like great, fine. But I just was, you know, I just like to be prepared. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and this is an opportunity for, you know, for them to move into, uh, you know, a, a new space. I, I'm assuming it's somewhat of a larger space and it definitely will be a nicer space uh -huh. uh, for these kids. Um, so yes, and, absolutely. And it, was, it, it was a Jesuit school, Pam? Is that what you told me earlier? Yeah, I, it, it was. Um, I think it's been closed for a few years. Do you remember the name of the school, Andrea? It was the what? Solomon Schefter. <laughs> okay. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. There yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it's kind of in the same vicinity as to what it was before. And, you know, it, it, it's going to be a good spot for, you know, for this population. So. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. So is there a motion from the committee? Uh, so moved. All right. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Mara, sorry, I was distracted by my Jones adorable daughter, <laughs> but I think I, <laughs> I, I think so was I. <laughs> Any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 
Uh, All right, wonderful. Uh, five zero. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight and good luck with the rest of the process of the purchasing and, and moving your school. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so you much. Also very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And you did, well. you did a great Welcome. you did a great job, Pam, with the uh, Google Meet. So okay, thanks. I hope I never have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. It's easy. Add it, add it to my resume. That's a good thing. Right. Thank you all. Thank you all so Thank much. much. Have a nice night. night. Okay, good luck. take care. All right. So moving along on our agenda, next up is superintendent report. So Dr. Thompson. Yes. Uh, so a couple things. I want to comment a little bit about the uh, the Commissioner of Education is basically having uh, weekly uh, Zoom meetings with uh, with all the superintendents, and it's uh, it's become must see Zooming, if you will, um, because we get little tidbits of guidance um, from that. This past week was very interesting because he was talking about the impending guidance that he's talking about coming out the week of the fifteenth of June about. Um, the um, guidelines for um, September. Uh, he was pretty adamant on that those will be very explicit. And in fact, the, the department will probably be more directive than it probably ever has been in the history of, of the department. He talked about a continuum. Um, I'm kind of pleased to, to, to share that the, the, what I've been talking about, about a continuum between kind of a, a partial open and, and, and more remote and being able to move back and forth seems to be what he was talking about as well. Um, he, um, although we will not know that for sure, uh, we have um, as an administrative team been having these conversations for the last two or three weeks, you know, in a theoretical uh, piece, we have moved, I think you heard um, a little bit about it. Well, maybe not at, at this meeting, maybe before all these meetings are running together. But uh, we have started forming a task force to start dividing up and looking at the different aspects of what the curriculum needs to look like, what scheduling will need to look like, uh, what kind of PPE we're going to need to have, uh, all of those sorts of things, uh, div divvying that up in preparation for the big reveal. Um, so we are looking forward to that. And, you know, I know everybody wants to know as much as we want to know exactly what September is going to be like. Um, and, you know, we are still waiting for that. But, you know, I, I want everyone out there to know that the Norwood Public Schools are preparing for that um, as we go forth, looking at the CDC guidance, looking at what other countries are doing. Uh, and again, those little tidbits that, that we're getting from, uh, you know, the state level as well. The other thing that he did mention is that the funding is still up in the air. Uh, he does not expect that to be uh, coming to us anytime soon. Um, the summer uh, protocols are supposed to be coming out early next week. He already, uh, the governor already released uh, the uh, summer day camp um, protocols. We are looking at that for extended day. Uh, I have uh, told, asked Director Capizio to look at that. My concern is with the increased cleaning and costs and the lower numbers of, of students and stuff that might change our funding for that program. Uh, but we are looking at that and hopefully we'll have something about that uh, quickly. Um, the other thing I want to just quickly address, bus passes. We are in the process of trying to uh, get our an online payment system up and running, an online registration uh, system up and running. So that's been kind of the delay on that but we do expect that to be out in the next uh, week or two. Um, and if we need to roll the date back based on when, we, when we're ready to receive, then, then we will do that. Um, tomorrow at four, I am uh, doing another Facebook Live. Uh, so if people want to um, tune into that, I will remind people that it is kind of a informal and difficult uh, format because the superintendent is trying to speak to a small screen, sprint, a squint and read the questions in the box and, uh, and formulate an answer at the whole at, at the same time. Uh, but I think it's important to, to give people a chance to ask questions. Uh, I have gotten about 20 questions uh, through the form. Uh, the form was shared earlier this week. It is also on the Facebook page if people want to put uh, those in there. There is a question about Lily the Portuguese water dog, which I'm very excited to answer. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Um, the other, uh, the other piece, you know, and I'm going to embarrass Maura Smith, but I want to, uh, you know, cause I don't get an addendum at the end. So I have to do it now, Maura, uh, <laughs> but I want to thank you, uh, for, uh, your three years of service. Uh, you brought a tremendous amount of talent and vision, 
um, to our, our team. And it's been a pleasure getting to know you and a pleasure to uh, to work with you. Uh, I will miss you. I probably will still bother you just because. <laughs> but, um, but you know your 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 intellect, your 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 you know, your, your thought about how to, how to bring these across people. So they're understanding, I, you know, I, I want to thank you. Uh, and I want to say that I, that I learned from you and I, I appreciate all that you did. Uh, the other thing uh, that. Thank if, you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, the other thing, um, if you will uh, indulge me um, yesterday afternoon, we, uh, we sent a letter out to the school community uh, about uh, the, you know, the racial injustice that we are all, uh, seeing and and, and, uh, and the protests and what have you. Uh, I will be completely transparent and give credit where credit is due. Uh, Dr. Galligan contacted me on uh, on Monday afternoon with uh, with an idea that he wanted, felt, felt that we should put a letter out. And I said, I, I agreed with him. I also told him I didn't have the time right then and there to try to compose a letter, which he uh, offered to do. Um, so, the, you know, so the letter is authored by he, and I'm sure, you know, knowing how he and Mrs. Doreen work together, I'm sure she had some, uh, some pieces of that as well. What happened after that is the letter came to the, uh, you know, to the administrative team and we were discussing how to distribute it. Uh, and we decided that it would come from the school principals, but it really is from the entire team, um, and just list the names from the bottom. So I, I, if you would, I'd like to read that because that only went out as an email to those that are either teachers or students or, or, or parents in the community. So, um, dear Norwood Public School students, family, and staff, we write to you with heavy hearts. Our hearts and minds are filled with confusion, anger, and sadness. We've watched it as you have with horror and despair, the recent murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. As leaders of your schools, we denounce these horrific actions. We recognize that at this time, our students, families, and staff members of color may be filled with fear, confusion, and anger, and may be experiencing trauma as a result of these actions. We, with our entire staff across our schools and districts, stand with our students, families, and members of, and staff members of color. We see you, we hear you, we value you, we care for you, we love you. In the Norwood Public Schools, our diversity is our strength. Our differences are what bring us together. As educators, we continuously learn and engage in conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Together, we pledge to support our students through these conversations, to challenge injustices and institutional racism, to examine implicit bias, and to remain committed to equity. For our parents, we have included the following resources from our partner, the Anti-Defamation League. As you know, we work with ADL to provide professional development for our staff on issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this year at the high school launched our inaugural year of the ADL's World of Difference Student Leadership Program. Parents may find the tabletop exercises on the killing of George Floyd and, Floyd and systematic racism, helpful tools for discussion, uh, discussing these issues with adolescents. This is an ongoing series and you may find uh, our, uh, the archives useful too. And there's a link to the ADL in that email. If anyone else would, uh, would like it, it is also on the school webpage. Uh, our hearts are heavy with these, uh, uh, our hearts are heavy Within these heavy hearts, we are trying to find room for hope and love that we so often pride ourselves on. It is, it is that hope and love among all members of our school community that will allow us to bring a positive change. We ask that all members of our school community stand together and do the same. We love your school leadership team. So I just wanted to share that and make sure that that was shared with the entire community. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, I've heard from a number of people that they really appreciate it, that letter going out. So if, if you and your team have not heard it directly, um, just so you know, a lot of people uh, were very touched and very proud that our leadership team addressed it in that letter. Well, we have, uh, we have an incredible, you know, and as a team where if anybody has an idea, you know, they, they bring it forth and, you know, we, we support any any good idea, so that's that's what we do. And, and you know, the, you know the words. You know, I, I guess Dr. Galgan's uh, BC uh, BC education paid off because that was an incredible letter. So I want to thank him. Yeah, he captured it really well. So thank you. Absolutely, Dr. White. Did you want to share anything? I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, I wasn't sure uh, no, if you were no, waving at I, me or not. I, I wanted to. Um, you know, be really present for that letter because I, I think it's very powerful. I too thank uh, Dr. Galligan and Cindy for their work on that letter. And um, it's, um, you know, we're, we're in a difficult time in our nation right now. And 
we all need to be leaders in this area. So thanks to everybody. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Wyatt. Uh, Dr. Thompson, did you have any further uh, superintendent report this evening? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Well, I, 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 yeah, I figured once, once, once Dr. Wyeth went, I wouldn't get a word in edgewise, so I, I muted. But that, but thank you. No, that's all for tonight. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Uh, so moving along on the agenda, um, going into budget. Um, as everybody will recall, last meeting we did start discussing again the uh, bus fees and possible reimbursement of the bus pass from this current school year. And there was a motion last meeting to table this discussion until tonight. Um, to allow the public to uh, reach out um, with any feedback they had on the topic. Um, again, I'm just checking the uh, school committee email, um, NPS school committee. Um, I have not received anything in that email address. I also have not received anything personally as a school committee member. Has any other school committee member received any feedback from the community on the issue of bus pass possible reimbursement? Now I'm seeing a lot of no. Okay, uh, Dr. Thompson, did you receive any more feedback? No, I have not. Okay, um, so for you and, and Ms. Sheridan, I know you followed up with um, Mr. Bishop again on this topic. Um, any new information from last week? I believe Ms. Sheridan has some. I don't know which number. Is. I'm oh, here. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Good. Hopefully I won't go up. <laughs> Um, I did do some investigation um, on what some of the other districts are doing, and uh, there, there's all different ones. There's some that are given refunds. There's some that are giving credits. Um, there's some that are um, offering credit and only giving refund if it's requested. Um, and there's also um, some that are reducing the fees for next year, and then others that um, are not doing anything. So it's really all over the place on the bus fees. Okay. Um, at, at this time, Ms. Sheridan, Dr. Thompson, and also with Mr. Bishop, you know, what is your recommendation to the school committee on this issue? Yeah, our, 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 our recommendation is, is to not refund the money. Um, and that's basically for, for several reasons. One, if someone moves or if they play sports, we don't refund money. Uh, we have continued to pay the bus company. Uh, and we are looking at increased costs uh, going into next year uh, with having to clean buses. Um, so I'm concerned about taking money out uh, out of the what little money is is extra in there. We're only really talking of maybe forty two dollars. People did not get a discount and paid the full amount. Uh, if you did, it probably is around twenty or thirty dollars. Um, but you know, we're looking at at increasing costs going in, into next year. The other thing that I that I will say um, is, is that you know schools are 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 collect money. We don't really pay out money. Uh, we're not set up that. In order to do that, we would have to make every single parent a vendor. And as you saw from the numbers last week, that's over a thousand hand entries into our payment system. So. I don't know how exactly that would actually occur at this point in time, um, you know, between now and, and October, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, returning money would be, we would need to hire people to try to return money to, to do it in any way, to do it this fiscal year. So, um, so that's, I don't know if Mrs. Sheridan wants to add to that. Um, um, well, I agree. I think um, the fact that uh, we're still paying the vendor and also next year, it seems like um, I watched a webinar on MASBO about uh, the implications of the COVID-19 with next year's transportation. And I mean, with the cleaning, um, less kids on the bus, I mean, the expenditures for busing seem to be going to be much more next year. So I mean, that would be my recommendation would be the same as Dr. Tom and um, Al. Thank you. Um, comments, questions from the committee at this time? Maya? Um, I'd like to make a motion to not refund um, bus fees. Okay, is there a second on that motion, uh, Dave? 
I tabled it last time. I did not receive any responses. Um, and I have come to a better understanding that we have provided a uh, good value. And even if we could reimburse this effectively, it would be too expensive. So I second the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, further discussion? Mara? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I completely understand um, the concern. I just, for me, I, I have a hard time voting in favor of not doing the refund simply because, you know, um, as I said last time, I think um, Maya have made actually a very good point of we don't refund when a student decides to no longer take the bus because they're doing a sport or, you know, they get a car or something like that. It, to me, that feels very different than this situation where we're simply no longer providing the service. Um, and I understand that $42 um, you know, might not seem like a lot, but to some families that might actually be money that they need right now. And I think even outside of that, I, I just don't feel right in us still, um, holding on to, to money that folks paid for a service that we're, we're not providing at, at this point. So that's just, to me, um, it's just kind of a, a simple equation of they paid for a service that we are no longer providing. And I, I do understand issues that, that go into doing that, but I just, I just don't, to me, I, I can't support not refunding that. Thank you, Mara. Other comments at this time from the committee? Joan? Is there an option to uh, to refund only upon request? I don't know who I'm asking that to, and I think I just broke Robert Rules of Order by suggesting something when there's already a motion on the table. But um, yeah, it's I mean- It's part of I'm the one discussion. <laughs> okay. I'd like to discuss whether or not we are able to uh, offer a refund upon request. Yes, but it also depends on how many requests. So a thousand requests, a hundred requests, you know, I mean, I, it, and I'll be completely honest, my, my first priority is to set up the payment system and, and get our bus registration up and running before we start trying to reimburse. Um, so that's, that, that has to be job one. And th this, again is is kind of the ongoing you know there, there isn't a lot of people to do extra work we barely have enough people to do the the regular work and we're we're challenged but that's you know it is what it is but yes depending you can, we can also look at a, a credit would be easier that's it i was just going to say that a credit upon request would be an easier option Dr. Thompson, will you remind us, please, um, how many families have already, you know, proactively reached out to you or to you, Ms. Sheridan or Mr. Bishop, uh, requesting either a credit or a refund? We have only we have only heard from two. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's two. Two. Further discussion? Um, do we want to vote on the motion? Are we wanting further things looked into? Because Maya's motion seconded by Dave is um, to not process the refund. So let's vote on that motion. All in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed? One. All right, so the motion passes four to one uh, to not refund the bus fees for this current school year. Uh, next on the agenda, budget transfers, but Ms. Sheridan, I believe we don't have any budget transfers this evening, correct? Uh, that's correct. I don't have any this evening. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now moving along to old business. So um, unfortunately, yet again, we do have to have a, what I think is going to be a quick discussion around the 2020-2021 uh, school calendar. So Dr. Yeah. Thompson? <laughs> yeah, th this uh, this comes strongly un under the category of you can't make this stuff up. So uh, as soon as we voted to uh, follow the state uh, guideline that the, the 14th of September was going to be marathon day and, and a state holiday, they quickly canceled the marathon and canceled the uh, state holiday. So uh, I would uh, respectfully ask the uh, committee with good humor to uh, remove <laughs> that uh that 14th of September from the calendar, go back to ending on uh, whatever that Friday was. Alec, do you happen to know that right at the top of your lungs or no? With that, because we, we, we're we going to have to go to that Monday. So now we're back to that Friday for the 180 and 185. Do you? 
Do you have that there or no? If not, I can pull it up. Is it on the? Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's linked in the last one. But anywho, so it's it's the fourteenth, September fourteenth. Right. Yeah. Right. So the 180th day would would go back to being the fourteenth of of June. Oh, I oh no, it's September 14th, we would be putting back on the calendar. Yeah, and is right. it June 18th, Friday, June 18th, that we would then be going to school until? Oh, I see. Uh, let me check here. I think uh, it's that's June correct. 18th. Yep, 20, that's yeah. correct. Yep, Friday, June 18th. Yep. It's 180. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so is there a motion from the committee uh, to make the, yeah, Mara? <laughs> is there a second? A second. Thank you, Maya. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Unanimous. Great. <laughs> okay, we will put the old calendar back up. <laughs> Dave told me this had to go back on our agenda. I was like, can we just have like a disclaimer at the bottom of the school year that <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, so moving along to policy, uh, we did have a policy subcommittee meeting. When was that? Last Thursday, I think, right, Joan and, and Dave and Karen? The 29th, whatever day the 29th was, Friday. Friday we met. Um, and you do have in your uh, packet a number of things from us. Um, we do want to discuss tonight the budget transfer policy that we made some updates to. Um, we're also going to take a look at the MASC policy audit service that we've been talking about. We have a uh, sample contract from them. Um, and then we did also want to touch upon on the uh, individual evaluations of the school committee members for Dr. Thompson's um, evaluation. So all of that material is in your Google folder. Uh, so um, if you look in the policy section, you have both the current um, budget transfer policy uh, which is file DBJ. Um, and, you know, as we have talked about before on this committee in our budget subcommittee meetings and our policy subcommittee meetings, um, the current budget transfer policy is pretty vague and has led to a lot of work in budget transfers coming our way that sometimes are for very small amounts of money and really are um, being done in a way that we have felt like as a committee, do we really need to approve every single one of these? So Ms. Sheridan did some uh, research. She looked at some other districts. Um, and she did put together um, the draft that you should have in front of you. Um, it says in the top in red that it is the draft format. Uh, we did approve this as a policy subcommittee on the 29th, but we, of course, need to bring it forth to the full committee. Um, was everybody able to take a look at that draft? Questions, uh, you know, from a Sheridan or um, feedback on that draft policy? Maya? Um, just a question about um, the, the transfers between line items within a major account that exceed a threshold of $25,000. So, oh, I guess I'm not sure exactly what we mean by a line item. I mean, I I understand the meaning of the word, but I don't understand like in in this case. Um, I guess is it possible that we might shift fifteen thousand dollars from one school to another without a vote, um, or like if it's within a major account, does that mean that it's staying in the same school? I just kind of want to understand what exactly that how this is limiting us. Yeah, great question. And we did discuss it, but um, Sheridan, do you want to answer? Um, well, the way that I thought it would be was, um, obviously, we've got the function codes, um, which would be, you know, for example, the instructional services, the 2000 account. So that's where we would ask for approval. But between the 2000s, for example, if there was going to be a jump of that 25, of 25,000 or more, um, for maybe, um, uh, I don't know, therapy services um, that is going to be moved to contractual services, then we felt that that should be brought to the school committee. And But anything under $25,000, um, we felt that it would just be reported. But the $25,000 we felt should be brought to the school committee. The Under the $25,000, we thought would be just a list that would be added to the quarterly report of the 
budget transfers that would go in the smaller amounts between those accounts. So that between the accounts would be within the 2000s area, all those accounts within that area. Or for example, within the 3000s area would be like transportation or our um, student activity. Anything of 25,000 or more within those accounts would be brought to the school committee for approval. So um, who would approve um, budget transfers like within the 2000s between schools? Like, you know, if we decided that if somebody wanted, you know, if the LMPA wants to spend more money and they want to take some money from the bulge, how does that happen? Do you mean above the 25,000? No, under the 25,000. That under the twenty five thousand, um, the when we wrote this policy, it would be that if it's within the function code list, which would be the areas, for example, instructional, that it would just be reported to the school committee, but would no, not. No, I understand the school committee wouldn't wouldn't approve it, but I'm assuming that it doesn't yeah. mean that Carolyn Robbins and Diane Ferreira duke it out, right? Somebody <laughs> oh, makes, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> who makes that decision, and how does that happen? Uh, the way I would think it would be the superintendent. Okay, that was my question. Mari, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I I was reading over this policy um, earlier today, and it's funny because I'm I'm sort of of two minds in that one I think it sort of streamlines the the functioning of the schools that not every small line I mean sometimes we get transfers you know very small amounts and I think to kind of streamline that it, it does make a lot of sense um, I'll say I have a, a, a sort of overall um, I guess theoretical uh, qualm about it and then I have a more specific um, wording within the policy form. Um, I know that within ed reform, right, we have the, the ability to move money around within the budget. And, and that's something that that obviously should should be happening to make the school function. I do know that um, <laughs> I'm trying to word this carefully, um, that sometimes causes some concern with members of town meeting, for example, who tend to think that we're moving money around um, in ways that perhaps might not um, be as prudent and that we don't have to come to town meeting to say all of those moves, which again, it makes perfect sense because then it would be utterly impossible to run the school district. Mm -hmm. I just worry that if we're doing something like this, where we're saying that transfers are happening, even if it's below a certain amount, but the school committee is only being informed, we're not voting on them. I worry that that may seem, that that may feed into some of those fears in a way. And it may, um, just undercut some of our advancements that we've been making in terms of um, being, you know, really, really transparent. Um, so I guess part of my concern is, um, I'm just pulling the, the policy up here at this point, um, uh, transfers between items within a major account that exceed a threshold of 25000 must be reported to the school committee as part of the director of finance. But we wouldn't necessarily be like, I guess my question is, it's going to be reported, but not voted on. And that, to me, feels like it's taking away some of the oversight that the committee would have. Um, and then that last, the, the second to last paragraph, the committee wishes to be kept abreast of the need for these adjustments so that it may act promptly and expedite um, financial record keeping for the school system. It To me, it, I, I just worry that this is kind of making the committee a little toothless. Like we wish to be approved, like kept in mind, but we don't necessarily have to be made aware. Do you know what I mean? I, I just, I worry that, I worry that that may be um, an obviously unintended consequence of this, but it's just, I worry about that. Okay. Yeah, Karen. Um, is it something that maybe if we had a smaller threshold that the budget transfers did not have to be um, approved by the school committee because what's what's happening now is a restriction it's even if it's a hundred over I have to get a budget approval and it's um, in munis it won't even allow me to put stuff in if it's ten dollars over so we're right. trying to find a way to be able to you know move forward better with the payables because right. right now it's sure. too constricting right right uh, yeah uh, dr Thompson and then yeah. David so, this, so this current financial software is 
much more restrictive than what we had before. Um, so we have to wait up to two weeks in order to bring anything to, to the school committee. Then we have to get it over to town, to the town hall, and they have to make the change. So it's turning into, you know, plus three plus weeks before we can, you know, spend an extra $100. Um, I've never worked in a system. Ian and I've worked in systems that have been designed by this same company where the business manager has not had the ability to, you know, overspend in a line and then and then do some approvals or, or, or moving around within a certain amount. Um, so that's another conversation. But but right now, I mean, we're we're literally scrambling because, it, you know, we need to buy PPE and other things along that line for the fall. And we got to add the money in the accounts to do so. And if we don't have the money in the accounts, we can't do it. And if we can't order it now, we won't have it. So this is a good example of why, you know, having having, having the rope, you know, and I agree that there needs to be oversight, you know, as a as a board member at the state and national level, that that's what we did. But um, it is it is over oversight, you know, the difference between oversight and and and, and management are, are, you know, need to be needs to be kind of a dotted line in there somehow but but yeah so i mean it you know maybe it's not 25 maybe it's 15 maybe it's 20. uh but you know the principal should be able to you know spend a little bit more or move money from you know instructional supplies to equipment without having to wait a month yeah thank you when you even when you order you know in a in a purchase system in a fist in a town system you send them a paper uh, you know piece of paper they send you it's it, it's a good two weeks even when you have the money to to order it so um it's not like you pick up the phone you give them a credit card and something shows up like amazon in two days so it, it it is one of those things where you know the you know the big moves should be the big moves and they should be approved but you know small moves are are you know what you what you pay karen and i to do so. Right. Yeah, Dave, Tanya. So um, I, I absolutely hear and understand Maura's uh, concerns. I have the same concerns uh, specifically because it seems like, ooh, 25000 and it could happen multiple times in the course of a quarter. But I also appreciate uh, Dave's uh, explanation of why and how when we have to be faster doing things because, you know, we get these budget transfer requests for relatively small amounts of money. You know, it's important that we ask why and how. Um, so I think a compromise for this, I'm, I'm fine with the, you know, if the budget subcommittee has agreed on the $25,000 number, that that's, seems to be in line with what's expected. But also I would prefer uh, when these things happen, possibly weekly, like email something saying these budget transfers happen. So we're able to ask rather than waiting for the end of a quarter where there are lots of budget transfers. You know, that would just make me feel more comfortable that I continue my role and what we're elected to do in oversight rather than being caught uh, flat foot at the end of a quarter with possibly lots of things to be explained. Um, so that would be my request for the change of policy if uh, the committee so wishes it. Yeah, Mara. Well, off of that, I mean, I guess part of my concern too is we have to vote to approve a budget transfer. What if we're informed of one retroactively that a committee member has a concern about? I, I hear your question. So, um, and Karen, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. I mean, we would still be getting budget transfers if it's going across function codes. Like that's still definitely happening. This provision yes. was really trying to figure out, you know, as, as Dave and Karen have already spoke to, a more um, efficient way for them to carry out management duties and and not have the delay. Um, so I'm hearing I'm hearing a couple things. One, the amount of the twenty five thousand. Do we want that to be different? And two, the reporting. So if, if there are items within a function code and a line item that we don't approve, but we get notified, when do we want to be notified? Is quarterly not comfortable? And do people want that notification more regularly? So that's what I'm hearing as the two issues we still want to work through. Um, but Joan and then Maya. Um, Maya actually had her hand up first, so. Oh, OK. But I spoke to this, Joan. You go ahead. Okay, so uh, what I'm hearing too is that it's not very clear that we're only talking about within building. Um, and for me, 
that makes a big, to me, that makes a big difference. That was understood by the policy subcommittee that this was only going to be taking place within building. Is, or is that not an issue? I don't believe that's how it's written. It's not, I don't think it's how it's written. Right. So that is an issue also that's coming up is that we conceived it as within building and that's not what came across in the written word. Right. But that's not what's being perceived. A question for clarification on that. Um, when we're saying transfer between line items within a major account, in Munis, aren't each building their own account? So isn't that implied there? This says the major accounts are the things that end in zero, zero. So it would be like a transfer from instructional services to school services. But within instructional services, there are accounts for each school. No, yeah. I understand that. I understand yeah. the transfers between the major accounts, but then the third paragraph where it says transfers between line items within a major account. Like, isn't like the bulge line item different than the Willet? So the concern of, of what you raised, Maya, isn't well, that that's already protected? I, that's what I was trying to ask. And I didn't, I guess maybe I'm not sure I understand either. Yeah. Karen, did you get um, that? Within the line items, yeah, we, I mean, we could re, we could report on any every school committee meetings um, the budget transfers that if you want every school committee we can or maybe lower the threshold to at least that maybe like a five thousand dollars or something so that like for example I had some sped legal fees and I couldn't even put those through because I needed a couple hundred dollars so um, it's even expenses that. Um, we have no control over the, them, like that special education legal fees and things like that, that I have no control over and I still can't get them through without a budget transfer. Joan, do you have a question specifically to what Karen just said? Um, no, I have a motion. Okay, well, cause I, I think Maya, was there something else you wanted to say Maya? Um, I just wanted to say that, um, so number one, the way this policy reads, like even on $25,000 change, we don't have to vote. We just have to be informed within the quarter, right? That's how it reads within, if it's a $25,000 $25, change within a major account, we would be notified within the quarter. Yes, that's how it's currently written. Okay, so so I, I you know, have concerns about that. Um, and then the other thing is, it, this seems to only be about school committee approval, but the policy says Nord Public Schools budget transfer authority policy. So I think if we are saying we don't need to vote, we still have to author like deputize somebody else to make the authorization. And probably the superintendent or maybe the school business manager, but somebody needs to sign off on that. It can't just be like anybody who puts yeah. in a request. Mm -hmm. Can, these issues came up in our, these, uh, we talked about all of this. And I think one of the reasons we're being caught, I wouldn't say we're being caught off guard, but it's clear that the conversation that we had as a, as a policy subcommittee did not get translated into well enough into the written, if there's this much confusion. So I'd actually like to propose that we table this. The policy subcommittee takes the feedback back and writes a more clear version um, of, with with better intent and more spelt out because we did discuss all of these things yeah. and we talked about all of these things and we addressed all of these things and then we didn't write them down. So rather than like, let's let's get a better draft version of what we intended out before you guys and then fully debate, you know, additional points. Yeah, I, I hear what everyone's saying. I One of my ongoing frustrations and why I'm glad we're going to be talking next about the MASC policy audit um, is because our policy manual is so out of date. And um, because some of the questions that everybody is raising right now, there are already issues in the current DBJ policy as it currently stands. There, there, it's already legitimate issues. And some of these things we're discussing tonight are covered under another policy on bidding. Um, so in the policy subcommittee, we're like cross-referencing and looking at all those policies and having these discussions and um, we, we just met on Friday, so we haven't approved the minutes from the last meeting. So that's also part of what's been lost in that translation, I think, I think too. Um, but just so that we are clear, um, because we do have to schedule another policy subcommittee meeting anyway, um, the committee would like us to look at the threshold 
is there a recommendation from the other three members for Joan and Karen and Dave and I to work on? If you're not comfortable with 25,000, what are you comfortable with? Yeah, Dave, Tanya. No, I think I am comfortable 25,000 because, you know, these are things that are expected and normal. Just I wish there was a, a more frequent update rather than quarterly, you know, because it seems like that could happen. It just seems like maybe if there was a way to keep that number and have a more frequent update, I'd be fine with it. Or maybe it's like a $10,000 number. But really, the number is arbitrary because, you know, it doesn't, there's no cap on it. Maybe a blend of something like, you know, should the transfers hit every 25,000, we get a report something like that. It's just, I don't have a firm grasp of totaling out all the transfers we've done. There seems to be a lot. And I don't recall anything being uh, even approaching that amount um, that came before us. But again, it's been a long time and many transfers. So, you know, I think uh, I would be just more comfortable with getting a more frequent update than quarterly. Okay. Um, Maya, Mara, yeah, Maya. Um, I, I'm okay with a $25,000 threshold if we vote over, if it's over $25,000. I mean, I think if the, if we approved a, a budget that said we wanted, you know, three first grade teachers at the Cleveland, and then, you know, we decide instead to have an extra, you know, two extra teachers at the high school and one first grade teacher at the Cleveland, like, I think that needs to come back to the school committee for a vote. And I don't think that this policy says that. Yeah, um, I just want to yeah, say, okay. one of the, I, I, I um, hear what you're saying about the 25,000. So that certainly would be something that we could do, change that to be, that had to be approved. Um, the other thing I think when we had the discussion, my, thoughts have always been as a business manager is whenever whenever anything goes over budget in a line, I always bring it to the superintendent. So it's I feel like my job is the um the bottom line of the budget, but within the lines, I don't feel as I have the authority to go over it unless I speak to the superintendent. So that's probably what we were when we had the discussion in the policy subcommittee meeting, we were talking about that, which is just the way that I've always worked is if it goes over in a line, I bring it to the superintendent and say, this is going over. Are you okay with it? And if he says, no, he runs the school and he makes the, that decision and then it's denied. But if it's fine, then it goes over. So maybe um, making a little clearer in this policy, but that's when we had the discussions, those were kind of the discussions we had. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Joan, just real quickly, and then I'll, I'll let you share. Um, we did talk about that, and I know I also asked, and I would love to hear the full committee's feedback on this, because there's policy and there's procedure. So, like, we're supposed to set the policy, but then when it comes to the management of Dr. Thompson and his team, that's more procedure. So we did have a conversation of what is the current procedure already? If this policy changes, how would that impact the procedure of Dr. Thompson down? Um, you know, the principals interacting with Karen, but I don't believe that is supposed to be in our policy. But thank you for setting me up for that because I was actually <laughs> going to say that. It's almost like, it's, so that was a nice segue. We do, Maya's right though, we do have to authorize who makes that decision around spending. And so that's simple to put into the policy to the, you know, the, school, com the school committee's designee or to the, the superintendent. Like we can make that 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 the, again this reflects the discussion that we had that we were all talking about for these safeguards in the policy subcommittee that never made it into that policy we never put we all understood in the room that dave was going to approve anything under twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand, but we didn't it didn't make it into the policy so we need to go back and make sure what we talked about is in the policy yeah i might have so I agree with you that we don't set procedure, but I think the line is that we might say the policy is that the superintendent has to approve these changes. And then the procedure would be either Karen sends him an email or there's something through Munis or there's some form that's filled out and triplicate. That's not our call, how they actually like the mechanism for making sure that the approval has happened. But I think it's totally a policy thing to say somebody's got to approve it. I feel very strongly that it needs to be triplicate carbon copy. 
<laughs> so <I'm... laughs> I am kidding. I do not feel that way. I agree with Maya's point. <laughs> okay. Mara, was there something else that you wanted to share? No, I mean, I was just kind of echoing what was going to echo what Maya said is I just, I think it's very, very important that it's incredibly clear who is signing off on these and um, what that, what that overall procedure is going to be. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of slightly less comfortable with the 25,000. I'd like it to be a little bit lower, but you know, that's my, my, my parting words to all of you. You can, you, you all get to decide, but I think 20, I, I'd go, I'd go lower, but, but that's just, Okay. And I'm not disputing anything anybody has said, but just, just to throw that out there, um, the other policies we looked at in other districts, they didn't spell out what we're saying we now want to spell out, which was another reason why I was perceiving it as more procedure and not policy. So just food for thought. And, you know, as we hopefully next conversation start to work with MASC more, I am going to be very interested and intrigued with all the things they tell us about our policy manual. Um, but Karen did pull, I think, four or five of their district policies that we reviewed, and, and none of them data what we're now saying we want in, in here. So just to be better. Okay. But we can definitely work on it. Karen? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Because, um, this, the policy that we have here was in so many districts that it almost made me feel like it was something from MASD. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it, there was so many that had the same policy. So, um, but I, I mean, I don't have any problem with, with adjusting it to what you guys feel comfortable with. Yeah, so we can um, meet again as a policy subcommittee. I'll, I'll send out a doodle poll to everybody tonight or tomorrow and we'll reconvene. And um, if there's any other further feedback that anybody has or, you know, Mara, you as well before June 8th. <laughs> if you have further feedback, um, send it to Dr. Thompson and, and we'll definitely incorporate that. Um, all right, so thank you for that great discussion. Um, next policy item is the MASC policy audit that, you know, we have been talking about for quite a while and really wanting to enter into that agreement. Um, so you have an email, just kind of like some background context of a thread that was going on for a while, um, but you also have in your um, Google Drive um, the draft contract from the MASC. I'm sorry, I just clicked on the wrong document. Um, so you'll see that it's highlighted, it doesn't yet say Norwood, but this is the, the draft terminology that if, you know, we as a committee tonight agree that you want us to move forward, then I as chair would say to them, please, you know, give us that final <laughs> draft, that final contract that says Norwood. Um, but basically what we are hoping to do and what we did put in our budget, we do have money in um, FY21's budget currently for this um, policy service is to bring MASC on board to help us really audit that tremendously large and outdated policy manual that we have that we've been trying to work on, but it's just a lot of work. It's, it's not possible for, for Joan and I as the policy subcommittee to do what needs to be done. Um, so they would get a copy of our current policies, all of our handbooks, um, some contracts you can see in, in this contract, all the different documents they would want. Um, and they do request that we give them 120 days to go through all of our stuff, mark it up, figure out where we need uh, some help. Um, and then they would schedule meetings with our policy subcommittee. We would work in tandem with them, really going through every single policy, updating where needed, taking things out if it's outdated. There might be new policies we're supposed to have that we don't have. Um, it's usually completed the entire project within 18 to 24 months. And it is required that you be done within 30 months. Um, if you go beyond the 30 month mark, then there's additional fees from what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, the overall project is $10,500, but that is broken down into three installments of $3,500, with the first installment being due when we sign the contract. And that is what we have budgeted for in the FY21 um, budget. Um, once it's completed, after 18 to 24 months, um, we get the manual back. We'll all get new copies of the manual. They put it on um, you know, flash drives for everybody. Um, and then if we wanted them to host our manual, because if you go to the MASC website, you'll see there's about 20 school districts who they host their manual for them. 
That's a separate contract. That's a separate thing that they call policy 21. Um, but what this contract for $10,500 does is bring them in, they review all of our stuff, and then they help us get it updated. Uh, so that's just a quick overview of what the contract states and what, as the policy subcommittee, we're hoping we can enter into in July. Um, but questions, feedback from the committee? Yeah, Maya. I think this is a great idea, and so I'd like to make a motion to enter into this contract. Thank you. Is there a second on that motion? I second. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Any third and fourth and a fifth it? <laughs> <laughs> I enthusiastically second it. <laughs> make sure I put that in the notes, Anna. <laughs> in the minutes. Um, but further discussion at this time? All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Wonderful. All right. So I will continue to connect with them, get a finalized contract to us, and very much look forward to their assistance with this very important process. So thank you. Uh, so last policy item, um, which isn't an official policy, but it felt like something I had talked to Dr. Thompson about it a while ago when we felt like we should start to hash it out in the policy subcommittee and then bring it forth to the to the full committee. Um, you know, as we all know, um, the timing of elections and committee members coming on and, and going off have been impacted by COVID-19. So we are in a very unique situation right now where, um, you know, tonight is Mario's last official school committee meeting. The new member will be with us on June 17th. And then we've already determined as a school committee that on June 30th, uh, Dr. Thompson will be giving us his self-assessment and we will all be compiling um, our individual evaluation. So it's just a quick turnaround and a very different timeline than we typically have done. So uh, as a policy subcommittee, we wanted to bring it forth for discussion on how we want to handle this in terms of, um, I, I think it would not be feasible or practical. And they did speak with um, Anne-Marie Mazzola, who uh, will be joining us um, to get her feedback. Um, I just don't think it's feasible to say, welcome on June 17th, write an evaluation on a superintendent that you're working with for like two weeks before that process. Um, so do we as a committee, and Mara obviously has a significant say in this, um, want Mara to contribute to the individual, uh, you know, her individual uh, evaluation? Um, or do we want to say that it will just be the four of us, Dave, Joan, Maya, and I, who are writing the individual evaluations? Yeah, I'll Laura. I, 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 heck, I'll start. Um, I, you know, when I, when I sort of, this, this topic was brought up, I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I think I will just share some concerns I have um, regarding it. Um, and this is not necessarily, I'm trying very hard uh, to sort of separate myself as the individual who would be doing it versus the larger you know, issue of, of what this may mean. And I guess my concern is just, I'm, you know, I'm leaving the committee because I decided not to run again. Um, I wasn't defeated, I, you know, nothing like that. Um, and I, I just worry that if someone was leaving and perhaps that hadn't been the case and that they, you know, might be feeling a certain way. We're kind of opening up the door for them to, you know, um, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not saying that anyone would do this intentionally, but, you know, people's feelings get hurt when they're voted out and, you know, perhaps things could, could, could work their way into the, the evaluation that otherwise, you know, may not. Um, and I also uh, am aware that, one of the main, you know, um, purviews of the, the school committee is um, to evaluate the superintendent. And as of June 8th, I am no longer the, um, or whoever would be in this situation, is no longer the person who has been elected by the town members to serve on this board. And I, I feel, I feel a little bit like um, that's overstepping in, in, in a way. Um, just my own my own person and again it's it, it's not necessarily about me but it's it's more to me mm. the concerns are about the precedent that it sets um just one other thought um off of what you just said Teresa, of 
that the options are either I do it or the four of you do it without Anne Marie. I, I just I don't know that it should be for the committee to make that decision for her before she's even been elected and even been a member of the board. Um, you know, if if she comes on, I mean, I remember I Teresa and I we we, we you know we both came on and we had to evaluate um, Jim Hayden when we had only been here for a little bit and. Um, you know, we, we did that to the best of our ability, but if she wants to um, recuse herself, I think that should kind of be left to her when she's she's on the committee. But those are those are just my my opinions. Yeah, respect everything you just said. Um, I think what I will do before other people um, contribute um, is just read what the MASC says. Um, try to be a rule follower, <laughs> just in the way I perceive things in my thinking process. But the MASC also doesn't regulate what we do, but this is their guidance, which in the packet, you know, I did link to um, their very new um, evaluation packet that they just created at the end of December, because as we all know, the rubric and the evaluation process has changed. Um, so on page 12, uh, which is in the notes that I sent you, um, they say that when a committee chooses a cycle that does not coincide with elections, it is useful to consider what happens if the composition of the committee changes during the cycle. Um, members stepping off the committee can prepare an individual evaluation that cover the period up until the point they leave the committee, and this can become part of the composite. So that is an option. Um, members that join the committee partway through may contribute to the evaluation based on the time they have been on the committee. So yes, you're absolutely right, Mara. Anne Marie would absolutely have that chance if she wanted to. Um, and then the MAUC goes on to say they may choose not to participate depending on how up to speed they feel, or they may decide to participate in part or fully participate. Of course, as members of the committee at the time of the actual evaluation, they are fully able to vote on the final evaluation if they choose. So that that's what's coming to us from MASC. So other thoughts or how do we want to proceed with this? Yeah, Joan. So the bigger issue is we need to move the evaluation cycle, right? Like, can we just not lose sight of that at some point after we solve the, the micro problem? Can we fix the systemic problem? and shift the evaluation cycle so it doesn't line up with our elections. Yeah, I mean, that's that's very, va very valid. I think that um, it's just even more tricky this year because, you know, we've all been through it. You know, Joan, you came yeah. on last yeah. April and evaluated Dr. Thompson the year before. Dave did that, you know, two years before that. You know, Mara and I had two months with Mr. Hayden before we had to do his exit evaluation. So I think by default, Lord has always kind of done this. If you're sitting on the committee at the time the evaluation comes up, you evaluate based on your experience. It's just now a very bizarre timing yep. and turnaround. And I didn't want to unilaterally make any decisions on this without discussing it with the full committee. So the, the biggest question, I guess, is around um, Mara, if, if you will be contributing your individual evaluation. Because there's nothing in here that says it's either or, that it's you or Anne-Marie. It could be both. So I guess that's the biggest thing that I would want to talk about since this is your last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <My up. laughs> oh, you mute it, Maya. I'm sorry, it took me a minute. My button didn't seem to want to unmute. Um, I absolutely value Maura's feedback and I think it would be appropriate for if Maura chose, to provide us with some narrative about some of the goals and and you know her specific interactions with Dr. Thompson, especially if there are things that the rest of us might not have been privy to. But um, I I think you know in the years past, what we have done is for each um, goal or criteria or you know standard, we have each made a recommendation for proficient, not proficient, like the different categories, met the criteria, not met the criteria. And I don't think that it would, to Maura's point that like she would no longer be an, you know, an elected member of this board that's charged with doing this. I don't know that she, like that, if she made an evaluation like that in terms of proficient or not proficient, that that should be counted in as we kind of you know tally them up at the end of the 
in the composite and try and come up with where are we at. I just, I, that makes me really uncomfortable to, to, in some ways that would sort of be de facto giving somebody a vote after they got off the committee. And as Maura said, this is not about Maura, this is about, you know, our practice going forward. It's certainly much more dramatic this time because there's like three weeks instead of two or three months, but it's all, as you mentioned, it's always been a problem. And, you know, I, I think it could be a situation where, as Maura said, it's somebody who's been elected off the committee. And if it's the will of the community, not to have that person serving on the committee anymore, then I certainly don't think we want to set ourselves up so that we have created some system where we need to take that vote into account. I, I hear, I hear you. I guess I'm seeing as two separate things, feedback and vote, because under none of this am I suggesting or is MASC saying that the person once unelected should have a vote on the compilation but the well, ability to provide the feedback. But I, I, certainly they wouldn't take a vote on the final composite document, mm -hmm. but what we have done in the past is, you know, if there's three exemplaries and two proficients, then we say that we the composite says exemplary in that area. So what happens if Mora's rating sways the where that goes? You know what I'm saying? I do, I do. And I just, I'm very uncomfortable with that precedent. So as Joan pointed out, and I think we all agree, the larger issue is realigning the evaluation cycle with, you know, when we do in September do the next round, whether it's a one year or two year um, cycle that we decide to move forward with at that point, we, we should definitely you know, think about this and then, um, Hope there's no more pandemics that mess it all up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so so moving forward, does somebody want to make a motion for this 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 cycle? I, I have a question. Do we need what's the what would we be making a motion on? I, well, I guess if we don't make a motion, we just default to practice we've already been doing. Right. Practice current practices. Um, Maura doesn't write and or whoever who, current practices, the current school committee does the evaluation, right? The sitting school committee does the evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, if we feel comfortable with that and feel like there's no need to, to motion on anything, we, we can move on. I Actually, I'll make a motion that we um, move the evaluation, not this year, <laughs> but next year. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know how else to get this. I don't know how else to get that done so it doesn't fall off our radar and happen again. Yeah, my only hesitation is that, you know, it's written into um, Dr. Thompson's contract that there is the possibility we're being a, a, doing a two-year cycle this next time around. Um, like, we're not definitively doing a one-year. Um, so do you just want to say that whether it's a one-year or two-year, we align it with the election cycle? I, I just want to give this a home so that it doesn't get dropped until next year at election time. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, does that mean, do we shuffle this to the policy subcommittee? Is this a policy so that we look at it and we bring something forth? Is it something that we, that, do you, I, so it doesn't really matter to me what we do with it as long as it gets a home and somebody gets responsible for it. Yeah, I think it could I, be a policy. <laughs> I don't know if other districts have a policy on this. Is, does uh, Dan Thompson or, or Karen from other districts you've been in, are you familiar with any policy on this topic? Dave, mute it. Trying not to make noise. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, it's usually just just how we're interpreting you know, the law. There usually is not a policy around it. Um, but we can make. But that doesn't mean the policy committee can make recommendations and not a policy too. So, you know, um, you know, ultimately, I mean, changing the cycle would be difficult. You know, unless it's a two year, I mean, if it's a two year cycle and then you go instead of going, you know, two full years, you go a year and 10 months and move the evaluation to the end of January or February, which is kind of where most districts have started to move them for exactly this reason. Um, sometime in that March, February, end of January time frame. But, you know, and again, you know, not that I'm campaigning, but 
you know, in order to be on a two year cycle, you have to be proficient or better. Uh, so, you know, but to, to try to do a plan for essentially six or seven months would probably be difficult. So to change it in this, you kind of need a two year, again, I sound like I'm campaigning, but you kind of need a two year cycle in order to be able to realign things. It's not a full two years, but you shorten one end of it. You know? Right. I think the other challenge is unique to Norwood and maybe some other towns, but not everywhere, um, is the way our, our election works is that you, you take office right away. Some other towns that doesn't happen, you know, there's a couple weeks or months and there is a more smooth <laughs> transition uh, with a number of things. So, um, so I'm fine. I, 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 yeah, Dave. Um, do we have the option for the new incoming member to abstain from the evaluation process? Because I, I, it's going to be a bit overwhelming. Um, you know, I, I can't expect anybody that's currently um, running for office to have watched all of our meetings to be caught up on everything or has even gone to training to go and evaluate someone uh, in Dr. Thompson's position. Yeah, um, I did briefly speak with her yesterday just to, I didn't want her to watch this meeting and be totally caught off guard and, and feel disrespected in any way. So I just gave her a heads up that this would be discussed. Um, just talking more like the training through MASC, which right now the MASC is not even offering the orientation, orientation training until September at earliest. And that is dependent on, you know, COVID-19. Um, they canceled their seven ones and they didn't move the charting of the course online. Um, so I did look into that for her. Um, she, yes, she does absolutely have the ability to obtain from it, both um, submitting an, an individual evaluation as well as it will be her decision if she even wants to vote on the compilation. Um, Can and I, I wasn't trying to make that decision for her. I just, I, I don't mean to be in any way disrespectful, but I'm just a little uncomfortable with this conversation. Like okay. if she's, if she's, and the only reason I'm saying this is if, if Emory is watching, it feels like it's being made clear that people might not think she should do the evaluation. And I don't want her to come on feeling that way. Like I, it's her decision, whether she wants to abstain or she wants to do it. As yeah. of June 8th, she will be a duly elected member of this committee. It is entirely in her purview to do the do the evaluation and it is entirely in her purview to abstain. So I just feel like having more of a discussion about whether or not she should do it or should abstain is just kind of coloring that conversation in a way that I don't think is fair to her or to the voter. Okay. That's very valid. Yeah, Dave. No, I, I agree with you completely. I, I probably was coloring that by my own experience, but I just want to know if she had the option or not. It is her decision, of course. She does, yes. Okay. So I don't think we want to make any motion. We'll just um, next week on the, when I say, I don't think we want to make a motion, I'm saying that's what I'm sensing from the committee. Not that I'm telling you, you can't make a motion. <laughs> you can make a motion if you want to, but my, my feeling is that nobody wants to. Um, and this is, this topic is on our agenda for our next meeting in terms of just solidifying, again, the timeline of everything. Um, because Dr. Thompson, as we already established, is supposed to get us his um, self-assessment by June 30th. Um, I did send out an email uh, the other day to everybody, not you, Mara, because you won't be on the committee anymore, but about our summer meetings. Um, and we had said um, July 22nd and um, August 5th as our summer meetings um, based off the doodle poll. And, and I did poll the incoming committee member too to make sure she could be part of those meetings. Uh, so next meeting, we can figure out more of this timeline piece. Is there any other uh, feedback at this time on um, the individual evals? Okay. So we can uh, move along. Um, I don't believe we have any donations tonight, right, Dr. Thompson? Correct. Okay. Uh, so school committee agenda. Um, Mara, would you like to go first or last tonight? <laughs> uh, last, you know, I always like having the last word. <laughs> All right, so I will let you go last tonight. I want to give you that option. Um, Dave Batania, did you have anything for an agenda tonight? I do. If I could go second to last, that would be awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go second to last, but uh... okay, that, 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 that's fair enough. I'll, I'll go I'll go now if that's all right. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so Maura, I've been caught flat-footed a bit because uh, I didn't really realize this was your last meeting. You've been with us so long, so uh, I fortunately was able to pull up the the speech that I prepared for what I thought was our last meeting that now lives in the drawer at our office, uh, at our, our, our school committee meeting room. So bear in mind that there are probably some references in here that refer to these four walls, which are not my house. You've never worked here, um, <laughs> and there's nothing behind me on the wall, so bear with me, and uh, here, here we go. So, and, and, you know, I've been really not saying much in my addendum speeches because uh, the connections have been a bit buggy, but fortunately today my phone really has died and I'm now using my landline to make this. So I feel more comfortable with uh, the quality of the reception. So uh, here we go. Uh, Maura Smith, we the residents of Norwood, our school administrators, faculty and staff have been both fortunate and blessed by to be the beneficiaries of your over three years of service on our school committee. Countless hours have been sacrificed by you both here and beyond these four walls. A time that you could have spent with your loved ones and friends, but were instead used to for the betterment of our proud community. Countless too were your sleepless nights, both before and after difficult decisions that you weighed with both compassion and wisdom. For who among us did not emerge emotionally unscathed from the cuts we were forced to make before the override vote? Moore spoke passionately night after night, sometimes even to the next day. <laughs> so she wept with rage, powerless to prevent the cuts for our, to our athletics, mu arts, music, and preschool programs. What kind of society do we live in where public servants must battle and beat into submission their own conscience in order to vote in favor of cutting preschool funding? Fortunately, the override did pass, and the cuts that we made were restored. Yet less than a year later, our budget battle rages on as unfunded educational mandates continue to chip away at everything we would like to achieve. Maura Smith, it is only fitting that your name and tenure is immortalized on the plaque behind us, an enduring record forever cast in bronze, connecting you to the legacy of all who have served before you and all who will serve after you. What you've helped us build, the golden opportunity granted by good education, will live on in the lives of our students well beyond your years. Maura Smith, we salute you. That's very I'm nice, not supposed Dave. to talk until my agenda, but thank you very much, Dave. It's very nice. You could probably get away breaking the rules at this point, Mara. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, Dave, that was, that was very nice. Uh, Joan, did you have any agenda this evening? I do not have anything anywhere near as eloquent as Dave did. Um, but Maura, I, most of my favorite moments um, of you come from executive session. Um, so I can't like fully share them, but I, it's safe to say I'm going to miss your little ray of sunshine in executive session. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the leadership. I, I've been on the committee with you for a year, but I appreciate the leadership um, that you brought and the fact that you were never afraid to voice your, your thoughts and your mind. Um, no matter kind of what the consequences were, no matter how often um, it may have gone either against the grain of, you know, what was being said or, or, or may have made folks a little bit uncomfortable who were presenting to us, you asked the hard questions and you weren't afraid to ask those. Um, and so I will both miss your, your, your ray of sunshine in executive session, um, and I will miss your hard hitting, your hard hitting but um, so needed questions in, in the public session. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate that. Thanks, Joan. Um, Maya, do you have anything you'd like to share tonight? I do. So um, at first, I want to acknowledge that today is June 3rd. So exactly a year ago tonight, um, I was standing at town hall with some of you and with one Norwood and with Jody Smith from the teachers union and with members of the board of selectmen and the FinCom and we were celebrating, um, you know, a vote of confidence, you know, that our town wanted to support education and um, was willing to commit to that. And um, I want to acknowledge um, everyone who participated in that, especially the One Norwood campaign group and, um, and especially Maura on that, because um, I know that uh, Maura's belief in uh, the need for an override was part of what motivated her to run for the committee in the first place, as it did me. And um, I think Maura like, had a real contribution to that. Uh, your perspective 
as both a former student and as a town meeting member, your skills at presenting information, telling a story, and knowing what people really want to know um, were hugely valuable to the committee and therefore to the Nord Public Schools as a whole. And um, I, on a personal level, have enjoyed working with you and um, I'll miss having you on the committee with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. Uh, so a lot of people have already shared a lot of what I wanted to say, but uh, Mara, I, I did write something. I'm just going to read it um, both for you and then on one other issue. So, so bear with me, everybody. <laughs> um, but first, Mara, I will miss working with you. I'm grateful for all the hard work and direction that you provided over the last three years. Uh, you were instrumental along with Maya last year on the budget subcommittee and on the BBC, um, really advocating successfully for the override. You helped transform how we have the conversations with the community around the budget, and that was no easy task. Um, you've always been an advocate, first and foremost, for student achievement. As Joan already alluded to, uh, you ask a lot of hard questions, and you hold all of us uh, accountable to answer those questions comprehensively. I know that there are many initiatives you've helped to start in advance that I promise you will absolutely continue, at least as long as I am on this committee. I will continue to advocate those things. Um, three years ago in February, when I decided to run for the school committee, I did not know you. I only knew your name. Um, I quickly met you when you and I both had the same idea to go to like every single PTO meeting in February and March. And um, I think the first one we went to was at the Coakley and you introduced yourself and you started to talk about your goals. And I just very quickly realized that um, we kind of shared a brain in many ways. And you were saying things that I was thinking on saying, and I was like, man, you stole my thunder. <laughs> um, but I realized right away that you were somebody that I, I wanted to work with. Um, and it's many times in the last three years, I've just been very grateful for you, as well as the other people um, around the table. Obviously, we're not all around the same table. You know, Dave Catani, as you said, we're, we're doing this remote. Um, but I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for all of you tonight. Um, I will miss you. I know you're not disappearing. I still have your number. Don't change that. I'll still bug you about <laughs> other things. <laughs> and I have no doubt that whatever next endeavor, um, you're going to continue to advocate and you're going to continue, <laughs> excuse me, going to continue to make the world a better place. Um, which does bring me to my second topic uh, briefly, which is heavier. Um, but I do want to make a statement on making the world a better place. And um, I do want to thank Dr. Thompson and Dr. Wyeth and the leadership team for that letter that uh, Dr. Thompson read tonight and that was sent out yesterday. Um, leadership, true and strong leadership, requires a lot of compassion and the willingness to have hard conversations and do really hard work. Um, it won't speak for too long because this isn't about me, but I do want to unequivocally state that Black Lives Matter. I may not have the same lived experience as all of our students, staff, and community members, but I promise to listen. I promise to continue to learn and improve and to help create and uphold safe and empowering spaces in all the ways that I can. Education is not immune to racism and it's not immune to the challenges of society. And as educators and leaders in a school district, we absolutely must be willing to do the hard work. And one of our five strategic objectives is focused on safe and supportive schools. We have declared already that through the implementation of social emotional learning, we, NORD Public Schools, will create a culture of care, inclusion, and safety for every student and their family in Norwood. It's necessary for all of us that we are educated in not only cultural competence and tolerance, but that we are also trauma informed. We need to actively demonstrate and advance our values of diversity, equity, and equality. As I said in my speech for graduation last weekend, this world absolutely needs people to be courageous and resilient. And I ask all of you, my colleagues, and all in our community in Norwood to hold me accountable if there's something more that I should be doing in this role in the school committee. Um, so, thank you. But now, Laura Smith. Last words. <laughs> Done for tonight. This is very weird. Um, 
no, I'd like to start off actually just by saying congratulations to the class of 2020 um, who graduated um, on Sunday. And I, you know, on my run, I go up by the high school very often. And I was up there on Sunday and I saw all the, the amazing signs that folks had put out. And as I was running up Nickel Street, which is a joy in and of itself. It's a very <laughs> steep hill. Um, I was very heartened by all of the the people who live along the route who had taken the time to go out and decorate so that the, the, it would be a really special moment for the, for the students, for their families, for, you know, the whole community. And I think that that whole experience really sums up what Norwood is and what makes Norwood special, that there's never really a question of, can we do it? It's just, well, we're going to do it and we're going to make it incredibly special and we're going to take care of everybody along the way. Um, and I think that, you know, there's that, that whole adage of it takes a village, but I think that Norwood is a really special village. Um, and it's been, you know, a real honor and a, a privilege for me to be in this seat, um, both at the Savage and this, this chair at home, which doesn't quite tip as much as the Savage ones do. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, for the last three years and I, I hope, um, and I, I've, I've, um, you know, always strived to be a voice for students, for families and, um, you know, to advocate as best as I can. Um, so I, I hope that I have, have achieved that, which I, which I set out to do. Um, I, I was, it was, it was funny, something that, that Dave said in his, his agenda really, really stuck with, there was a lot of things that stuck with me. It was all very, very sweet, which everyone, everyone has said, but Dave said that I, I could have been home with my, my friends and, and my loved ones. And I would actually sort of say that I was just here with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a real lovely time getting to know all of you and all of the people who have been on the committee through all the, the previous years that I've been on it. And it's been a real joy getting to know you all and, and getting to work with you. Um, I guess it's just my, my final thing that I'll say is I, I've, I've been reading, if, you, if people who know me know that I, I read very long and intense uh, history books. And I'm, I'm currently reading a book um, that talks about John Gilbert Winnett, who was the uh, American ambassador to um, Great Britain during World War II. And he gave a, a speech uh, memorializing President Roosevelt after Roosevelt's passing. And he said something that just really stuck with me, that even in the darkest days of the Depression and the black days of World War II, he never lost hope hope that things would be better. And I think that that's one thing that's really struck me with this committee is that we always have hope that no matter what, we can make it better. And no matter what the situation, we will find a way to help in ways that, that people need to be helped. And I think that that's a real testament to this committee, to this school system, and to the people um, within it. So I would just like to say thank you for entrusting me to to be a part of it for these last three years. Um, I will definitely not say goodbye because I have I have no doubt that this is the last you'll you'll hear from me. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, and then just on a personal note, I do have to say because I was I was told I had to uh, thank you to my my lovely wife who for these past three years had to deal with me coming home very wound up, and she would be like stop. <laughs> <laughs> have a cup of tea and go to bed. <laughs> so, um, so thank you to, to Kate Smith for, for dealing with me for three years. And thank you for all with to all of you. <laughs> thank you, Mara. Yeah, thank you, Mara, for all you've done. Thank you. Yeah, it's so weird, like this remote thing always, but especially now because like I really want to come over and give you a hug. But uh, I know, you know. know. <laughs> when it's safe to do so. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, we do have to enter into executive session this evening, <laughs> but not you, Mara Smith. You get to uh, just to sign off on this since we are talking about um, contract negotiations. Um, so I, I need a motion uh, to enter into executive session. Uh, we will only be resuming um, to um, adjourn the meeting. So, so move. is there? It's yeah. the last time I get to do it. So move. <laughs> so motion by Mara is our second. I'll second. second. Thank you, Maya. And I do need to pull everybody individually. So Joan. What happens if one of us says no? I'm just. <laughs> I don't know. You don't get to come to the party. Let's not figure that out tonight. All right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That a yes, Joan. <laughs> yes. That's a yes. Thank you, uh, Mara. Yes. Dave, Tanya. Yes. Maya. Yes. 
um, a yes as well. So I will see you all in executive session. Uh, to everyone else, have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.